Active in various scientific areas in the natural sciences as well as in the social sciences and the humanities, eight highly qualified junior scientists are currently researching a wide range of topics in the ATTRACT program. Physicist Philip Dale is tackling one of the most important challenges in the field of renewable energies. His group of experts aims to develop the next generation of solar cells. These are no longer made of silicon and use only extremely thin photosensitive layers to convert light to electricity. There are many types of thin film solar cells. Those developed in Luxembourg have an advantage over other technologies. They are made by depositing ordinary materials such as copper, tin and zinc in chemical reactions. The materials are then treated in an oven to make them form a new compound. The end result is solar cells that have a great potential to provide a large percentage of our future power supply. The materials we use, they are earth abundant. This means we can find them everywhere on the planet and therefore we can deploy this technology on a very large scale so we can think about replacing power stations. With other technologies, we use a rarer element and therefore we cannot imagine to deploy them across the whole planet as we need to. Physicist Andreas Michels and his group are researching the magnetic properties of metals without which the modern world would be unimaginable, the rare earths. Most electronic equipment could not function without alloys of these materials. How dependent we are on these scarce resources depends on how efficiently we can exploit their magnetic properties. Using a latest generation magnetometer at their lab, the researchers can study samples at a temperature of minus 270 degrees Celsius. Only at such low temperatures do these metals exhibit their full magnetism. In order to understand how the microstructure and magnetism of these materials are related, such samples can be characterized by bombarding them with neutrons. The experts therefore perform these experiments at institutions equipped with a research reactor, such as here at Helmholtz Centrum Berlin. We study the correlations, the, the relations between these uh, features of the microstructure and the magnetic properties. So we vary certain aspects of those microstructure, we can change the microstructure, we can vary the crystallite size and then um, study its effect on the magnetism. And in this way we aim to optimize um, the magnetic properties. At the Luxembourg Center for Systems Biomedicine, ecologist Paul Wilmes is studying microbial communities. More microbes populate the human body inside and out than we have body cells. But not all microbes are pathogens. Many are in fact crucial to keeping us healthy, such as those in the gastrointestinal tract. For their work in the lab, the research group has developed a new device, the Humix. It allows them to study a common culture of living human cells and microbes in a representative liquid medium. It's the only one of its kind in the world. To develop models for analyzing even more complex microbiota, the researchers are also taking somewhat unusual approaches. Samples taken from a biological wastewater treatment plant, for example, help to deepen their knowledge and help them draw parallels to the microbiota in the human body. Biochemical processes that occur in a wastewater treatment plant also occur within, for example, your gastrointestinal microbiota. But most importantly, the method development that we've done on the, on the wastewater treatment system, we're now translating into questions regarding the human microbiome, and they are absolutely transferable. And all of the know-how we've generated in the wastewater treatment plant, we're applying to questions of human health and disease. Also working at the Luxembourg Center for Systems Biomedicine is biologist Carsten Hiller, who is studying the metabolism in human cells. To accurately determine the numerous metabolic products and paths, they cultivate living cells and feed them with isotope-labeled substances such as sugars. Next, the experts prepare the cells to analyze their molecular components down to the tiniest detail. This is done in a mass spectrometer, which can analyze an enormous number of samples in a short time. This delivers to the researchers precise information on metabolic quantities, rates and paths. It is a kind of detective work that delivers a picture of the vital functions of the cell 
and allows one to study precisely how metabolism changes under the influence of pathogens or drugs. We were interested in inflammation and in this case we had immune cells from the blood and we induced an inflammatory response so that the cells try to fight against bacteria and in this context we discovered a new metabolite that was made from sugar in the cells and this metabolite later on turned out to be antimicrobial and it was before it was not known that cells of our body can produce this metabolite. Theoretical physicist Massimiliano Esposito uses no expensive equipment. His research group is investigating how the fundamental laws of thermodynamics, one of the pillars of classical physics, apply to the world of nanoparticles. Large objects, such as car engines, convert energy, in this case petrol, largely uninfluenced by fluctuations in environmental factors such as temperature. But what happens at the molecular scale, for instance, when cells burn energy from food to move muscle? In this environment too, tiny biological machines are at work. But fluctuations in the environment have a much stronger effect at this microscopic scale. Different physical laws apply in the nano world from those we are familiar with. The classical theory of thermodynamics has to be modified to describe them. It is the only way we will gain a better understanding and develop new and more efficient nanotechnologies. Energy conversion can be done much more efficiently when you are operating at very small scales compared to large scales. So if we construct very efficient devices at small scales by putting them in parallel, we could have a very efficient way to convert one source of energy into another. So we can use this thermodynamic theory that we develop to understand why nature has succeeded in being so efficient and operating so efficiently at this very small scale, far from equilibrium, highly fluctuating environment, to learn what are the key ingredients and once we know what are these key ingredients, we can reproduce them in artificial devices. Oliver Corns is looking into an entirely different matter. The literary scientist is studying the representation of politics and politicians in literary texts and other media. He and his colleagues are not primarily concerned with analyzing the stylistic devices used. They are much more interested in literature as a reflection of the understanding of politics in the epoch it was written in, be it current or historical works, which allows them to identify the changes over time. The discourse in the 19th century is centered around the question, how can we have a good representation in the field of politics? Today, I would say the political discourse um, is challenged by politicians who think of themselves and they represent themselves as normal people, having nothing to do with politics. They don't want to be perceived as politicians at all. Which is highly interesting because in the end, of course, they are politicians. Psychologist Samuel Greif works in the field of educational measurement and applied cognitive science and is developing tests for measuring problem-solving capability. Experts believe the demands on school children, students and workers in terms of solving problems are more complex now than even a few decades ago. The environment and working world are constantly changing and teamwork is becoming more important. People are also increasingly using complex technologies to organize their daily routine and complete their tasks. In light of this, it's more important to be able to solve problems flexibly and efficiently than to acquire specific factual knowledge. The researchers' tests are fully mature and are even used for the worldwide PISA study, which surveys 500,000 students from 70 countries every three years. Our contribution to the PISA study was the development of the framework for problem solving, the theoretical framework, and subsequently the development of the items that now run in the PISA tests. But our involvement in the PISA studies is not limited to PISA 2012. We are also involved in 
item development and uh, theoretical development for PISA 2015. In PISA 2015, collaborative problem solving will be assessed, an extension of problem solving towards, well, doing that together with other people, doing it in teamwork. Bioinformatician Ines Thiele came to Luxembourg only recently. An expert in computer modeling of microbial and human metabolism, her work is expanding the core research at the Luxembourg Center for Systems Biomedicine. Her goal is to put together a research group that will develop analytical methods from available data for computing how food influences health via metabolism. A project that builds upon previous successes and takes them a step further. We just recently published a computational model of human metabolism, which is the most comprehensive one available right now. And that was a community effort, so more than 40 researchers actually participated. And it describes more than 7,000 metabolic reactions. It's still not complete, but it's the most comprehensive that we have right now. And about 1,800 uh, metabolic genes. And so it describes what's going on in a human cell. The ATTRACT program allows a growing number of young experts to conduct research at the highest level autonomously and with suitable funding. With it, they are ensuring the young scientific environment of Luxembourg will gain international renown and become a firmly established player.